Perhaps one of the greatest attacks on the Word of God is the personhood of Jesus Christ and whether He is who He claims to be. Some regard Jesus Christ as a good teacher, a prophet, someone to be admired, or even a created angel. Considering these different points of view, is it important that we really understand the specifics of who Jesus Christ is? Absolutely. Not only is it important, but your very salvation hangs in the balance on whether you understand this fact. For us as believers to go out into the world and preach the good news, we must have a solid understanding on who we serve and worship. In this lesson, we will take the time to delve into the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, the word deity simply means a god or goddess. Therefore, when I state that we are studying the deity of Jesus Christ, I am referring to whether Jesus is God and worthy to be worshipped as such. There are many religions who claim that they believe in Jesus Christ, but in all actuality, they deny his divinity. Here are a few examples. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus Christ is the first creation of God the Father. Muslims believe that Jesus Christ is a prophet. And Mormons believe that Jesus Christ was once a man who worked his way up to becoming a god and is also the brother of Lucifer. Can you see where it would become vital to understand the personhood of Christ? For example, you could be speaking to someone about Jesus Christ. And while you both acknowledge the name of Jesus Christ, you could be speaking of two completely different people. In a way, it is as if I bump into a friend at church and say, Hey, what's up? Have you met Frank? And the friend says, Yeah, he has long blonde hair and blue eyes. He's a great guy. And then I say, That's not the same Frank I am speaking of. The Frank I am speaking of has dark hair and brown eyes. The same can be done with Jesus Christ. A person may be saying the same name, but describing a completely different person. This is nothing new. The Apostle Paul had this same issue in the church of Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4, he states, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach. Paul here is stating that it is possible for people to be deceived into believing in a different Jesus. The following lesson is designed to guide you through the Word of God so that you may be equipped to not only understand the truth about who Jesus Christ is, but that you may be able to teach and help others to know the true Jesus as well. Let us begin with where the Bible first mentions Jesus, not by name, but by purpose. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, it states, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The context of this verse is taking place after the sin of Adam and Eve, where the Lord is directly addressing Satan's role in the downfall of humanity. Immediately, we are told that there would be two injuries in a sense, the strike to the head and the strike to the heel. The word strike here in the Hebrew is shuf, which means to gape, break, or bruise. To strike someone's head to the point of breaking is a deadly and permanent injury, which is contrasted with striking someone's heel, which isn't deadly, but rather a temporary injury. It is here that we find the first mention of a Messiah coming to redeem mankind by defeating the enemy. Throughout the entire Old and New Testament, there are numerous mentions, or rather prophecies, of this person coming to redeem his people. It is this promise that the entire Bible is predicated on and Jesus Christ claims to be that person. Now, that scripture alone does not prove that this person is divine or God, but I do believe it is an important verse to keep in mind throughout this lesson as it will become evident as to the only one who would be able to accomplish such a task. How did Jesus Christ describe himself? When you seek to get to know someone, it is important for you to allow the other person to express and describe themselves in order for you to begin to paint an accurate character profile. Of course, it is important to also collect information from outside sources, such as those who are closest to them, but more on those later. Our focus right now will be primarily on the words of Jesus Christ as we begin to see the beginning sketches of his character. In John chapter 10, verses 30 through 31, it states, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. One must ask the question, why are the Jews picking up stones to kill him? Is it wrong to say that he is on one accord with the Father? I mean, doesn't the Bible also state that when a man marries a woman, they become one in a figurative sense? Did the Jews misunderstand him? No. The Jews knew perfectly well what he was claiming. They were adhering to the law. Jesus was not saying that he has the same goals as the Father, though that is true. He is claiming to be divine, or rather, to have the same nature or essence as the Father. Just in case there is any doubt, let us examine the Shema which is the core Hebrew prayer and the Jews' primary declaration of faith in one God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
For us to attain a good grasp on what is being said, we must consider the Hebrew meaning of a few of these words. First, Lord, or otherwise known as Yehovah, means the self-existent or eternal. Our God, also known as Elohim, specifically used in the plural, thus especially with the article of the Supreme God, and one, Echad, which means properly united, that is, one. Simply put, by Jesus making the statement, I and the Father are one, he is stating that he is the self-existent one who shares the same nature as the one supreme God and they are united. There is another instance when Jesus Christ claimed to be God when speaking to the Pharisees. In John chapter 8 and verse 58 it reads, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. At first glance this may seem like an insignificant statement. False teachers incorrectly translate this to mean that Jesus Christ was only saying that he existed in heaven before Abraham was born, which is not the case. As your knowledge of Jesus Christ progresses, you begin to realize that Jesus Christ consistently uses terms ascribed only to God and then applies them to himself. This is one of those moments. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 it states, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. When Moses was seeking a name to give to the people of Israel, the name I am was the one that God chose to give. Therefore, Jesus took that title and applied it to himself. The Jews knew full well what Jesus was saying, and they tried to stone him for blasphemy. Finally, there is one more passage that I would like to share in which Jesus ascribes himself the title of God. In Mark chapter 14 verses 61 through 63 it reads, But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? When Jesus is being questioned by the Pharisees, he is asked to give a direct answer to the question, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Jesus said, I am. But he didn't stop there. He continued quoting yet another Old Testament passage that displays his deity. He quotes Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 through 14 which states, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Did you catch that? The scripture stated that all nations and people worshipped him. When combined with Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8 which states, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other. It becomes abundantly clear that since the Lord doesn't give his glory to anyone, and we see that Jesus Christ is given dominion and honor to the point of being worshipped, it therefore becomes abundantly clear that Jesus Christ is claiming to be God. What did others say about him? Earlier I mentioned the importance of collecting information about someone from outside sources. I believe this is an effective way in developing a clearer picture of someone's characteristics. For example, if you were to try to get to know someone based solely on consulting with that person, they can tell you anything they wish and leave out all their shortcomings and flaws. But if you ask their associates, acquaintances, friends, and family about them, you begin to develop a more comprehensive character profile. We will begin with those closest to Jesus, his 12 apostles. Jesus Christ's ministry lasted approximately three years. And during that time, his apostles ate with, lived with, and learned from Jesus daily. If anyone would know if Jesus was in fact God, these men would. These men were not blind followers of Jesus Christ, and they did not suspend their judgment simply because of a charismatic leader. Many times they questioned him, doubted him, and sometimes thought he was wrong in how he handled situations. These men examined and scrutinized every detail about Jesus Christ and whether his claims about himself were true. Let us begin with the Apostle John. In the book of John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John here is hearkening back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 which states, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
There are a couple of interesting points I want to make concerning these verses, as I believe they are simply astounding. First, the Apostle John is making a bold claim in stating that Jesus was with God before creation. But not only that he existed, but that he is also responsible for creating all things. People, animals, angels, planets, galaxies, etc. This is a triumphant statement about the deity of Jesus Christ. If all things were made by him, that would make him eternal since God would have to be outside of time. And since these characteristics are ascribed to Jesus Christ, that would make him God. Another focal point is in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, which states, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Here in the first book of the Bible, the statement of God as a plurality is made. He, being God, is not speaking to himself. Rather, he is showing communication amongst God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thereby making Jesus part of the Godhead. Another apostle's testimony concerning the deity of Jesus Christ would be in Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, which states, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? One point I want you to focus on is that Jesus never met this man prior to this event. So there is no chance that the man might have sinned against him in the way that you and I might sin against each other and thereby forgive one another. The only conclusion that can be drawn from this is the man sinned against God. If the man sinned against God and only God can forgive sins committed against him, no other man could offer that forgiveness. Therefore, the only logical conclusion is that Jesus is God. The Jews recognized Jesus was saying this and wanted to kill him for blasphemy. Perhaps one of the greatest testimonies given by an apostle proving the deity of Jesus Christ comes by way of Thomas. In the book of John chapter 20 verses 27 through 28, speaking about Thomas doubting Jesus' resurrection, it reads, Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Earlier in the chapter, you discover that Thomas was not there to see when Jesus initially revealed himself, and that is why he doubted. He then made the statement, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Remember earlier in the lesson, I stated that the apostles were not blind followers, but were individuals who doubted and demanded evidence. This is one of those moments. Thomas, after being shown undeniable evidence that Jesus' resurrection was real, he concludes that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my God. He recognizes the deity of Jesus Christ. Finally, the testimony of Paul and Timothy paint quite an amazing picture about the true personhood of who Jesus Christ is. They focus on Jesus Christ prior to him coming on the earth. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8 it reads, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul and Timothy are speaking here of Jesus Christ doing the one thing that the Old Testament has been speaking of since the beginning. He humbled himself and gave up his glory so that he might sacrifice himself and become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Remember the scripture I said to keep in mind at the beginning of this lesson? In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus Christ himself is that offspring that has come to defeat death and Satan. That was the mighty strike to the head. Satan was defeated along with the grip of death he had on mankind due to sin. The devil may have temporarily crippled Jesus at the cross, but Jesus permanently destroyed the works of the devil. No mere human being could accomplish such a task. We as people are sinful and could in no way atone for our sins, nevertheless the sins of mankind. That is why we needed someone who could perfectly keep the law and overcome sin in ways we could not, and that person could only be God. Thus, proving that Jesus Christ could not be a mere prophet, man, or just a good teacher, because that would imply that he was sinful. Since all men have fallen short of the glory of God, we need something more than a man, a king, or a prophet. We need God. Jesus Christ did things only God could do. Here are five examples. Number one, he calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. Number two, he forgave sins. Number three, he is involved in judgment. Number four, he claimed to be the way through which salvation was attained. Number five, 
he was worshipped as God. One of my favorite Bible passages that point to Jesus Christ being God has to be John chapter 5 and verse 23, which reads, That all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There is only one way to honor the Father, and that is to worship him as God supreme. Therefore, it is completely logical that we should honor the Son Jesus Christ in the same way. It also states that if we do not worship Jesus as God, then it is impossible for us to worship the Father. We cannot separate the two. How does the Father refer to Jesus Christ? Individuals who believe in God have no problem accepting the fact that the Father must be worshipped, and I agree. Is there a passage where God the Father calls Jesus God? I mean, a verse like that should be able to silence anyone who thinks to the contrary. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, it reads, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. There it is. The Father says, speaking of the Son, Jesus Christ, Thy throne, O God. The Father clearly in this passage acknowledges the deity of Jesus Christ. Here are two words used most here are two words used most commonly by individuals who seek to deny Jesus' deity. Number one, begotten, and number two, firstborn. These may seem like common and harmless words, but when used out of context, they can cause deadly consequences. Let's start with the word begotten. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, it reads, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here is where the skeptic begins to twist the word begotten to reduce the godhood or deity of Jesus. The skeptic will say, You see, the word begotten means that Jesus was created. He had a beginning, therefore he cannot be eternal, so he can't be God. We must be extremely careful not to use our English definitions and apply them to the Greek or Hebrew texts. In English, the word begotten is defined as the past tense of beget, which means to produce offspring by sexual reproduction, used especially of a man to cause to exist or occur or produce. While the Greek word used is monogenes, which means only born, that is, soul. The word in the Greek doesn't mean to bring into existence, but rather it is focusing on the uniqueness of Christ being the only Son of God. Here is a biblical account using the same word monogenes when describing Abraham's son. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17 it reads, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. We know from Genesis chapter 15 and verse 15 that Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. So why use the word only begotten son? The word begotten again is being used to describe the uniqueness of Isaac being the only son through which the covenant and promises were made. The scripture isn't speaking of bringing Isaac into existence in the same way that John chapter 3 verse 16 isn't speaking of Jesus being brought into existence. Rather, it is speaking of the uniqueness of Jesus being the only son through which the promise of salvation would come. Now, what about the word firstborn? Many skeptics also use this word to say that Jesus Christ was brought into existence by saying he was the first one born of all creation. Again, it is vital not to take an English definition and apply it to a Greek or Hebrew text. The word firstborn in the English language is defined as the first to be born, eldest or a person's first child, while the Greek word used here is prototokos, derived from the two words protos and tikto. This word can be translated to mean first one born, or it could also be translated to mean preeminence. So which definition do we use? It is important when reading scripture to always read in context, along with using the entire Bible to be your guide if you ever encounter a dilemma such as this. First, let us read Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 17, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now this scripture creates a dilemma. If firstborn means first one created, then how could he have created all things and be before all things? A thing is something created. Do we have a contradiction in the Bible? Not at all. Let us look at an Old Testament scripture to get some context. In Genesis chapter 41 verses 51 through 52 it reads, And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for said he, God hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. 
Now contrast this scripture with Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 9, which reads, For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. In Genesis, Manasseh is called the firstborn. But in Jeremiah, Ephraim is called the firstborn. Which one is it? Ephraim was called the firstborn even though chronologically he was the second one born. That's because the title firstborn is speaking of rank, position, or privilege. Here is another example used in the scripture to highlight this fact. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 it reads, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Again, if firstborn only means a chronological order, then this scripture would be a lie because Jesus was not the first to rise from the dead. Lazarus was. As you can see, the title firstborn is speaking of Jesus' preeminence or rank above everyone else. Now the scripture makes sense when it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or preeminent one of every creature, for by him were all things created. In summary, as determined by overwhelming and insurmountable evidence, Jesus Christ both claims and demonstrates that he is, in fact, God. I pray that this Bible lesson was a blessing to each and every one of you. It is also my prayer that this ignited a fire within you to search and seek to spend more time in God's word due to it being filled with beautiful treasures of wisdom. These treasures aren't meant for us to keep to ourselves, though. Instead, it is meant for us to share with the world. And if anyone tells you Jesus isn't God, Remember, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. I pray that this message was encouraging to you and that it motivates you to put your faith in Christ. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at servantofchristministries at gmail.com. Until next time, God bless.